and they were earning 6%. People weren't defaulting, but 6% is not enough to charge on a loan when you're suddenly having to pay people no longer 3%, but 9%. Well, that doesn't really make a lot of sense, does it? Because guess what? When trouble comes, who's going to have to pay to go buy new umbrellas? Taxpayers. I don't think the Fed's uh, raising interest rates was going to do much for inflation because of what caused the inflation was not demand. It was lacking of supply because of supply chain problems. Like, it's like chips in a casino. When you go into a casino and you exchange your money for uh, chips, those chips have value in the context of the casino. But if someone yells fire, fire, you're not going to want to take your chips and go outside and try to get a taxi. No one's going to accept it as money. You want to go back and exchange it. Well, this interview is with Kathleen Day, a business author and journalist who is currently a lecturer at John Hopkins University, specializing in financial crisis and how they spread. She's the author of two books about the banking crisis, SNL Hell and Broken Bargain. And this is why I thought she would be a perfect guest to discuss the failure of Silicon Valley Bank. Enjoy. I read your book about 10 years ago or so on SNL Hell. And when this situation with Silicon Valley Bank happened, I, I immediately thought that there are some similarities. It was same interest rate environment situation. And that's why I reached out to you. I, was, I asked you, like, is there parallels? Can we, can we talk about that, right? Maybe, yeah, absolutely. Maybe you can tell us uh, first, summarize what happened with Silicon Valley Bank recently and, and Signature Bank. They weren't prepared for an environment where interest rates could go down, which is silly because if you're in finance, it's one of the biggest risks, a change in interest rates. And you want to make sure that your assets and liabilities uh, have a similar duration so that you can... Um, match the interest rate. So if you're locked in, so if you've borrowed money at a certain rate um, and interest rates are at a certain rate, then you know you and it's locked in, you're fine. Even if interest rates go up, you're still you haven't paid more for funds versus the investment, but you're fine. But what they did is they were they were banks can only invest or hold securities in what are government like treasuries or near government like Fannie Mae or Freddie Mac, which are securities held by these giant mortgage companies that are government um, created government um, Freddie yeah. and Fannie, the government and, and the government now manages them because they uh, ever since 2007. So um, those are the only things banks can hold. But the problem with um, Silicon Valley Bank, it had too many of it, had too much of this on hand. It would have been better uh, having more cash and fewer of these, even though these are very safe, they're very, very safe holding government securities. Nonetheless, when interest rates went up, the value of these securities went down because there's an inverse relationship between interest rates and principal. So the value of these securities went down and they started having a run on the bank. People started saying, you know, we're a little nervous about um, the environment that we're in with high inflation and we're high tech companies because that's what a lot of their clients and we're having to lay off people and we're having a cash crunch ourselves. So we need to withdraw some of our cash to use it. Uh, and so suddenly the bank was having higher than usual cash withdrawals to meet those withdrawals. It's not that it didn't have the money long-term, but that money was tied up in loans and also in these government securities. Because the government securities were worth less than what they had bought them for, to meet these cash withdrawals, they had to sell these securities to, to, to raise cash to pay uh, depositors who wanted their money. And they were having to take what's called on the street, a haircut. They had to lose money on these. So they lost about 1.8, the, 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 the securities that they had to sell to meet cash withdrawals, they lost about, I, th I think 1.8 billion. Will not, it'll take a while for we know all the exact yeah. um uh, things. But anyway, so the point is, it was a classic interest rate mismatch. It was exactly what was going on in the 1980s. But it was the run in the, on the bank that actually was the last domino, right? It's not necessarily the mismatch. It's not that loss on the on those uh, investments that uh, pull them down. Well, yeah, it is because, I mean, it, the, the two are inseparable. There are times when a bank will lose money for things beyond its control, right? Mm -hmm. If there's suddenly COVID or, or Russia invades Ukraine and things happen that no one expected, it can change the business environment. And that's what happened in the 80s with the change in oil prices. But it, 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 things are out of your control and it may cause some losses, but you can make your losses worse if you haven't prepared your balance sheet to mm -hmm. 
address different risks. And so the bank had not done that. It had too many securities relative to cash uh, than, than was prudent. And the regulators fell down on the job because they didn't, they're now going, they're now trying to say, oh yeah, well, they gave the bank warnings. Well, you know what? You're the Fed. When the Fed <laughs> comes to you and says, you know, change your mix of assets, just in case interest rates change, you'll do it. Um, so they were acting and a, and a lot of people acted, even though it was really stupid. And the Fed was acting as a bank regulator as though interest rates were never going to change. And of course, the Fed helped set interest rates. And I personally think interest rates have been too low for too long, and, and it's been artificial. Yeah. Uh, so I think the Fed has done that. So but at any rate, the Fed is its own worst enemy. One side of the Fed was keeping interest rates too low for too long. That lulled everyone to sleep. The bank didn't take proper risk precautions. Suddenly, the Fed says, oh, inflation. And in an equally, I think, silly move, raised interest rates to try to deal with inflation, even though interest rates weren't going to fix a supply chain induced inflation. And we can talk about that. But at any rate, I'm not alone in that. I don't think the Fed's uh, raising interest rates was going to do much for inflation because of what caused the inflation was not demand. It was lacking of supply because of supply chain problems. So mm -hmm. the Fed keeps interest rates really low. Everyone's lulled to sleep, including the regulators. Then suddenly the Fed raises rates to try to combat inflation. And the bank says, whoa, we weren't prepared for this. And, and the Fed says, whoa, we weren't regulating you. And it's everybody screwed up. So you're basically saying uh, that inflation is not necessarily going to be coming down just because interest rates is going up, right? Inflation is a ratio. It's 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 supply and demand. And you can mm -hmm. have both moving at once or one going up or one going down. I mean, if you have in if you have demand at X and you uh, decrease supply, it's the same as keeping supply the same and increasing demand, right? I mean, it's they're relative to each other. And so what really caused inflation, uh, recent inflation, and one of the reasons it was a little bit mystifying because we had inflation, but really strong economy at the same time, yeah. but it wasn't stagflation. It was high employment and inflation. That's because the inflation was caused by a, a, a crimp in the supply chain because uh, China told all its workers to stay home. So it's harder to get supplies. Uh, when when ships docked on the West Coast, uh, people were sick or home because of COVID, so they weren't there to unload the shipments. The ships were getting stuck in canals. Uh, uh, so worldwide, there were crimps in the supply chain, and that meant that it was harder to get supplies. And so if, so, if demand stays the same and your supplies go down, that's going to make prices go up. So the Fed does raise rates. In, on the theory. Now, remember, interest rates themselves are a cost. It's the cost of money. Yeah. So interest rates going up is a way in which you can in, 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 contribute to inflation. But interest rates also reflect the market's um, view of what is going to happen with inflation. So yes, demand can go up. But the problem is much of the demand that stayed steady was not demand for uh, a lot of frivolous things. It was it was demand for basic things that wasn't going to go down by making it more expensive. That was I wanted to ask. I want to, to, I thought, well, maybe Fed's want, Fed wants people start losing jobs, so they can't uh, buy expensive stuff. But you just answered well. It's not so. It's not it's like not that. Oh, stop buying that expensive jewelry. Yeah. Uh, and we'll do it. So, uh, uh, so the Fed was raising rates to try, the idea of raising rates, the, the theory, the Fed raises rates, money's more expensive to borrow, so people will buy less. Instead, people are having to buy less because it's more expensive. So maybe they'll buy a dozen eggs instead of two dozen eggs. Eggs have been in the news of being really expensive. Yeah. <laughs> and so, um, but they still need eggs. Uh, or uh, some kind of food and uh, gasoline. Gasoline was another one that went way up. Uh, gas, gasoline contributed to inflation if you count it or not. There's different ways of counting inflation, um, and that's all up to Mr. That's all down to Mr. Putin um, uh, and his nefarious world plans. So these are things that you're not going to bring prices down for gasoline or for eggs. Uh, or uh, I don't, I mean, I would have to follow back wire eggs up and it's a little controversial. Was that just price gouging or not? But 
uh, wh where did you get the feed? Where did the feed come from that you're feeding the, the chickens to, to lay the eggs? And is or was that held up on a, a slow boat from China? You know, we, you have to look at the whole world supply chain because it's very linked. Um, if you look, for example, at what it takes to do make a silicon chip, that chip goes all over the world from, you know, where it's designed to where it's stamped to where you get the raw materials to make it. I mean, it has a huge footprint in the sense of all the places you have to stop and get supplies. So when you interrupt that, um, it's expensive. And just raising rates doesn't necessarily decrease people's demand for something. They might buy fewer of them, but they still need to buy it. Got it. Yeah, that makes that makes sense. So with what happened with Silicon Valley Bank, do you think it's over be, uh, after government uh, stepped in? Or you think it might be one of those calms before storm? even bigger storm? What's I don't think it's um, going to be anywhere near as catastrophic as the 1980s because there was an external, um, what economists call exogenous, an external reason for the, for the balance sheet of those specialty banks called thrifts. Those banks went belly up or, or two thirds of them did. They suddenly were insolvent because um, overnight, because no, nothing that they did wrong, the, eco the economic circumstances changed overnight, and we can talk about that. But uh, so, so even if they had been, they, then the, the government compounded their woes by mishandling how to handle the woes. So it mm -hmm. went from a sixty billion to six hundred billion dollar problem. But but regardless, there was a, a problem there. Now, it and then in two thousand seven where people first looked, there was a banking crisis, but that banking crisis was caused by banks making really dumb loans that looked like they were yeah. going to make money and then didn't. And then they suddenly didn't. And then they were suddenly insolvent. So both are both of those were sort of outsized problems uh, within which uh, people acted stupidly. Mm -hmm. This, it's unclear to me that there is a he, a, a, an outside problem within which Silicon Valley's woes are 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 happening, except for the fact that I do think that interest rates have been kept artificially low. Mm -hmm. That favors some market participants, in, especially those who invest in stocks. And so the Fed has been, I think, complicit in keeping interest rates artificially low. And so when it suddenly has to raise them, even if you can say it's wrongheaded to raise them, um, although you might say that maybe they should just raise them somewhat because it's more natural and what the market really reflects, uh, maybe they needn't have done it as much as they did to try to combat inflation because you could argue it wasn't going to combat inflation, but maybe they needed to have rates go up just because they'd been artificially low. So I don't think there's a big economic problem out there that that we don't know about that is specific to banks. It's not like they just went out and made a bunch of dumb loans. Silicon Valley Bank was very tied to tech and tech is having a contraction issue now. So they that's unique to them. So you can always have a regional yep. problem with banks, whether it's regional geographically or regional by product. So you could have the Southwest could be devastated because oil prices go down, or you could have Silicon Valley in a problem because tech industry is slowing down, regardless of where the tech is. So in that sense, I think there's a thing, but I don't think there's a worldwide problem. Now, you can see with Deutsche Bank and these other banks that have had problems, there's always a question in banking. Do we have too many banks? And so when when the sun is shining and interest rates are low, everyone acts like, oh, this is never the party's never going to end. And so when the party does end, you suddenly see that there's not enough chairs. The music stops, just to mix metaphors. <laughs> music yeah. stops, there's not enough chairs. And so you have to say, are the people that couldn't find a chair, do we really need them? And maybe that's overcapacity in banks and and uh, maybe we don't need them. Let's... So there's that kind of maybe global problem with banks. I mean, and also these banks are so big. Why, you know, there was a paradox at the end of the last crisis where, there were so many huge banks failing because of all the stupid things they had done. They <laughs> shot yeah. themselves in the foot. But to to rescue it immediately, you almost had to make them bigger by by merging them and yada, yada, yada. 
but but then everyone sort of forgot about that and and no one ever went back and said you know maybe we need to unwind it on the contrary the trump administration said uh oh yeah well we you know the sun's shining so we don't need any more umbrellas so we don't need to address this it was really dumb and so now we're here where it's starting to rain is it a flood is it is it Noah's Ark time? I don't think so. I don't think it's catastrophic, but it is raining. <laughs> there's economic dislocation and there's some economic uh, crimps and things. And the banks weren't prepared. And that's their job. That's what supposedly they're special. <laughs> yeah. Uh, let's talk about SNL crisis because uh, for a lot of viewers, it's too remote to remember. But yeah. you wrote a great book about it and it, it's actually fascinating. Uh, can you Can you kind of start with what are the SNL, what are this uh, uh, savings and loan banks and wh what do they do and what, what happened in the 80s? Okay, well, uh, savings and loans, also called thrifts, were a specialty bank. They're just a bank, uh, and they but they specialized in home lending. And in particular, uh, we imported the idea from England where they're called buildings and loans. Um, in, in, and again, it's a specialty bank. It doesn't lend to big commercial lenders. And in the United States, they often had names like Dime Savings or they had what would what it would happen is immigrants to the United States would come and pool their money and then lend to each other to buy a home where a, a commercial bank wouldn't lend to them because commercial banks at the time, you know, historically didn't like consumer uh, consumers. They didn't like lending to consumers. They found a way to do it with securitization, but that's another story. Um, so people, people who came here, you know, most people build their wealth. Most people's source of wealth is their the home they own. Mm -hmm. They're not going to be billionaires from it, but it's the way that most people amass wealth that they can pass on to the next generation or use to pay for their kids' school. So savings and loans are for are kind of a mom and pop bank for the little guy to go in and put in savings and take out a loan for a home. And that was the idea. And that was great when it worked pretty well, when after the crash of 29 and the 1930s uh, uh, recession, Congress put in place caps on interest rates. So Congress said, you can only pay so much uh, to someone who has a savings account. And then the market can set the rate that you can lend at. So, uh, so these thrifts had a what was called the six three six model, which was they um, they paid. Uh, I'm sorry, three six three. I mixed it up. Three six three. I've ruined the joke. Three six three. Um, the three six three model was they 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 paid uh, the maximum they could that that the law would allow. They paid you three percent on your deposits. They gave home loans at six percent, so there's that three. They made the month their profit on the three percent difference, and they went and played golf at three. So that's what they did, the three six three rule. But then Congress, in response to inflation, that's why again it it echoes the period we're in now in this huge inflationary period of the end of the seventies, beginning of eighties, caused by several things, but not not the least of which was the oil producing region in the Middle East decided to yank America's chain and raise interest rates. Um, and so in, and so it was part of it was an energy fueled inflation, no pun intended. But it interest rates at that time went up to the prime rate was like 21%. I mean, it's, it's sort of amazing. So yeah. in my lifetime, I've seen it go up to 21%. And then I've seen uh, you know, after in the run up to the um, I'm sorry, af after 9-11 interest rates, you could argue were negative. I mean, people money was free, <laughs> even though there were interest rates on it. If you took into account inflation, interest rates were like below zero. So it, there have been extremes. Um, so that's what happened in the 1980s. There was an interest rate mismatch suddenly uh, to respond to this inflation, to respond to this oil-induced inflation and other factors too that I go through in the book. And I think in a more bite-sized manner in my new book, I think I, I've i condensed that bigger book. I mean, if you, I'm glad, I love that you loved all those details. I love that period, um, but I have it more condensed for him. But anyway, so so uh, the government said, oh, okay, you know, we're gonna, de we're gonna say uh, you can pay whatever you want for savings accounts in response to inflation, because otherwise people were pulling their money out of thrifts, their deposits, because Merrill Lynch would offer them a higher rate. And even though it wasn't guaranteed, they wanted that higher rate. So to help them 
keep money from going out of out their doors, which caused a little liquidity crisis like Silicon, Silicon Valley Bank. Bank experience. The government said, okay, we're going to let you pay anything you want. So they did. The problem was the assets on their books, those home loans, our long-term assets earning 6%. They were good assets and they were earning 6%. People weren't defaulting, but 6% is not enough to charge on a loan when you're suddenly having to pay people no longer 3%, but 9% or 10% or 12% to park their money, to deposit their money in your um, in your bank. So the banks suddenly were insolvent and the question was how to handle it. And the government made it worse. How should, what should have they done though? Like, I don't even well, see the solution there. Well, you're going to have a loss. Look, there's sometimes, you know, you live by the capitalist sword, you die by the capitalist sword. You can't have it both ways. But what often happens is, oh, we want capitalism when the sun is shining, but we want socialism when it's not. And socialism for whom? For the well-to-do and industry. And they call it different things. But when they are sitting there saying, we don't want socialism. Oh yeah, really? Well, let me, when you come to me for a bailout, you kind of do. Yep. Um, now, sometimes you need it uh, and it's a good thing to do and it helps us all. And that's uh, to avoid it, what is called systemic risk. So you want to, and that's what happened with uh, uh, Silicon Valley Bank. You want to placate people and make them feel assured so they don't take their money out. And, and that can be a good thing because when everyone gets their money out of the bank and it causes mayhem, it's not good for anybody. But what the government should have done, in my opinion, in the 1980s is just shut those and, and taken mm -hmm. the loss, the $60 billion loss. It was going to be there whether you recognized it actuarially or not. I love accounting and that's where all the bodies are buried. <laughs> and the body that was buried was a $600 billion body. Uh, thank you very much. And that was going to be uh, an expense no matter what. There were too many thrifts. We didn't need them anymore. Commercial banks had started lending to consumers because of securitization. All kinds of things were changing. You didn't need so many anymore. Cut your losses. You know, Put this, this dying thing out of its misery and uh, move on. That's what they should have done. Instead, the lobbyists for the industry said, no, 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 we want to stay open. And because they were mom and pop banks, they were on the corner of every single congressman in Congress's district. Every congressman, um, you know, New York is the center of the big commercial banks, and there wasn't a city bank on the street. There might be a, a branch, but there wasn't a city mm -hmm. bank uh, type sized institution on the corner. But there was a thrift. Uh, a thrift everywhere. And so they lobbied to, no, no, give us, you know, change the accounting rules so that we create this fiction that we're, op that we're solvent and, uh, or give us subsidies and, and write us a check and do all these things to make it seem like we're okay. And by keeping money losing institutions open, and I mean money losing because they were fundamentally flawed. There was no longer yeah. a call for so many you make the problem grow bigger. And so it went from a $60 billion problem that was an interest rate in mismatch problem to suddenly a bad asset problem. Remember with the interest rate mismatch, yeah. the the mortgages were good. The, the, they, they were earning money, just not enough. But when you start uh, keeping sick institutions, you let them stay open, they start gambling. That's called moral. They start saying, you know what? We, we might as well try if, if, if people who gamble, you know, they say, let me shoot the moon. Let me see. I might have a bigger loss, but I also might make up all my losses. And so they were taking bigger and bigger risks because the, the fact is they're lenders. Mm -hmm. Banks are lenders. And when there were too many banks and not enough good places to put your money into, because there weren't, there were too many banks and there weren't enough places to invest in, which is what a loan is. A bank is investing in something. They started investing in increasingly risky stuff. And increasingly risky means more of it's going to fail. And it did. And so you had suddenly a bad asset problem. It went from being an interest rate mismatch problem in response to the oil uh, hikes, uh, price hikes, into a bad asset problem because these institutions that should have been closed were left open. And they grew into a bigger problem. It went from a $60 billion to $600 billion, and that's before interest. Yeah, that's 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 interesting. And yeah, and I highly recommend people to read the book. It's uh, it's fascinating. And uh, I really you, appreciate it. I want to plug my new book only because, <laughs> because Yale you would tell me you, if you, I didn't. Yeah, you cover several other uh, depressions, uh, like recessions related to banking in that book as well, right? Maybe, can you can you share? Yes. It? Yeah, but the thing the thing is that uh, I remember it, when uh, the two thousand seven crisis hit. To me, it seems like it's mm -hmm. yesterday. Um, and several uh, people that I know, including a 
a friend of mine who had worked for the Fed forever and 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 actually helped Bernanke write his book. And he had been an Associated Press reporter during the thrift crisis. And so we were keen competitors, but also professionally uh, friendly. I remember when 2007 hit, we both said, wow, this makes the 1980s look like a piece of cake. Well, the problem is when I wrote my second book, I discovered that the 1980s set the stage for the 2007 crisis. So um, it's 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 not that 2007 was eclipsed it in severity, which it did in some ways, but it was also caused by it. And I don't think what people realize, the potential taxpayer bailout of the 2007-2012 subprime mortgage crisis, yeah. the money that was either spent to try to fix the problem or was committed in case it was needed, it wasn't always used, totaled about $24 trillion. That's oh, a lot Jesus. of money. That's a lot of trillions. That's more That's than I made. Is, but, 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 but the savings and loan crisis of the 1980s is still the more expensive. So the, the bailout of the 1980s, which had been the biggest up until that point, was, was eclipsed by the bailout or potential bailout of the 2007-2012 era. But because a lot of that money in 2007, 2012 was either paid back and largely because of Freddie and Faye, but most of it was paid back or, mm -hmm. you know, few, the government, the government could, you know, say, Oh, we, we, we got through the crisis. We don't actually have to do that just by saying we would, we didn't have to do it. Um, so, so a lot of the cost, the, because of that, m most of that 24 trillion was either never spent or was paid back. The savings and loan crisis still, in terms of expense to taxpayers was way more expensive because that was a, um, a, a multi-trillion, a multi-billion dollar, depending on how you calculate it. Um, they, the government tries to minimize it by saying it was 132 billion, but that doesn't count. That's with a net present value that is ridiculously low and it doesn't count interest rate and all this <laughs> stuff. It's, a, it's probably closer to about three to five a hundred billion dollar problem that they they never expected to be repaid because they they didn't they said look you know we waited too long these are our losses we should have uh, cut our our losses before we didn't let's cut them now even though it's grown ten times let's just do it and they did so the bailout of two thousand seven was twenty four trillion compared to under a, a trillion for the SNLs but the residual cost to taxpayers of the 1980s crisis was much higher. And when you said uh, SNL crisis set the stage for 2007, what do, you, what do you mean by that? Well, that's when people began to say, let's have uh, these derivatives. We don't need, we, we should be having, in the 1980s, uh, one of the reasons you had thrifts versus commercial banks is commercial banks didn't like lending to you and me. And yeah. it's not because they didn't like us personally. Uh, and they did some lending, but they left the home lending to the thrifts because dealing with individuals are me is messy. So the banks didn't want to become property owners. So even with the best underwriting, uh, if they underwrite for you or for me and then give us a loan, we could lose our job or get divorced or or get sick and default. And so then the bank is left holding it and then they, they don't want to do that. Securitization revolutionized the world because what it meant is you could combine a bunch of consumer loans and put it as collateral for a big bond and sell that bond. And then it's off of your books as a lender and investors like it because they also don't have to deal with the underlying uh, individuals. They get a rate of return based on a pool, and mm -hmm. you have a trustee who whose responsibility it is to figure out how to deal with individual defaults. But the bank does; the lender doesn't have to do it anymore, unless they're paid to do it. Sometimes they have a whole branch where that's their business. They have a little unit that does it. But the bank doesn't have to deal with individuals anymore. They 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 give you and me credit cards, and they give us. Um, consumer loans, uh, home loans, and then they get those off our books. And, and they like to do that so they can get that money off the books so they can do more lending, but they also like to get it off the books because they don't want to deal with us as individuals. Derivatives revolutionize that. The problem with derivatives uh, for uh, as a risk mitigator is that if they're used properly, they do mitigate. They never eliminate, but they do mute risk but if they're misused, they magnify it. 
And so securitization and derivatives went hand in hand in the 1980s as tools to mitigate risk. Securitization got consumer loans so that um, it was packaged as a group and mm -hmm. you could um, do statistical analysis on it, what's now called big data. Big data is not new. It was always called something. It's called statistics. And we just have a bigger sets of data and we have better tools, better computers to analyze it. But so you you could you you with uh, securitization, you could move the stuff off the of books. And then with derivatives, you could also uh, how are you going to mitigate in case uh, there were defaults on those? You had this uh, these derivatives that were default risk default. They're called default swaps. And what they really are is an insurance product. And this is absolutely mm -hmm. true. The reason they weren't called insurance is that would have made them regulated by state insurance regulators. And the um, big uh, Wall Street didn't want to be regulated by the 50 state insurance regulators. So they don't call it. They don't call it an insurance product. They call it a swap. But guess what it is? It's an insurance product. It says, hey, you uh, you, you own this security. Well, we'll sell you another security on top of it that says if that security goes under, we'll pay you a certain amount of money. And if it doesn't, we get to keep the premium you paid for it. So anyway, that's how, what happened. But in the, in the, in, so that became to be a dominant way to manage risk, securitization and derivatives. Mm -hmm. Little insurance contracts and uh, um, securitization. Uh, and in it, it, it came from the commodities market. Those, those insurance contracts have always been there in the commodities market for corn and pork bellies and all that other stuff. Uh, but uh, so you have it suddenly this dominating Wall Street, the, this machine, these huge machines of you sell consumers gazillions of credit cards or gazillions of home loans, and then you package them and use them to collateralize a loan, and then you sell that bond to the public, and you have it on a mega scale, and then you sell them an insurance product in case that bond goes under, and you do this in on mega scale. Uh, the problem is that all depends on statistically uh, important, uh, not statistically important, you have to have statistically robust security. In other words, you can't have all those securities tied together. They can't all be to the same person. They can't mm -hmm. all be to relatives of one another. They can't all be on the same block. Uh, they can't all be tied to the, in other words, they have to have some, everyone who's taken statistics will know to be statistically healthy and, and significant. You, if you're going to have a pool of something, the set, the individual uh, items in the set, in that pool have to be independent from one another because if they're dependent on one another, then then they're then then it's not really a pool. It's just yeah. like one big same thing. Anyway, make a long story short. Misusing those two tools of securitization and derivatives didn't mitigate risk; it magnified it and it lulled everyone to sleep, including someone like Alan Greenspan, who said ridiculous things like housing prices never go down. Well, it, that was just demonstrably <laughs> not true. And you could look at data and he, who has more data than the Fed, he could have looked and seen, but whatever. Um, uh, I mean, not just whatever, it's whatever to the tune of $24 trillion bailout. But the point is when you have these risks tools, if you misuse them, you, you then create these huge collateralized bonds that, are not statistically healthy. They're all tied to each other. So when one goes, they all go. And that means that suddenly all these people are gonna lose money. You thought you were diversifying and mitigating against risk. Instead, you were concentrating it. And that's what happened. There is a scene in the movie, Big Short, where um, <laughs> Ryan Gosling actually walks through this. It's pretty entertaining how he describes it. It's interesting. So let's talk about the bro uh, the uh, the broken uh, bargain. What do you what do you cover in broken bargain that you didn't cover in SNL and in our discussion right now? What else goes in there? Well, broken bargain I wrote because uh, Johns Hopkins asked me to come and bring a course I had been teaching at Georgetown based mm -hmm. on my first book, a Saving the Savings and Loan Crisis, which they were using in the ethics class uh, for a newly at, at the time what was a new graduate program in real estate. Uh, because crises, financial crises often involve real estate and, and securities markets. And, and so they wanted to use, they, 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 you were using my book as the textbook and they said, why don't you come teach it? So then Johns Hopkins asked me to come to Johns Hopkins and bring that course uh, to here and so at the business school at Johns Hopkins, which I did. 
And so I was, I realized to teach the 1980s, you have to teach, go back to the 30s, and then you have to go back to the crash, and you have to go back to the 20s, which in so many ways looks like today, cars, consumer society, it's <laughs> when we went from being uh, farmers to uh, living in the city in America, all these things. But what was different is in the 1920s, there was zero regulation of finances. And then in the 1930s, you had you, you, you created the landscape that we are still operating under. And that was all reaction to the 1929 crash and subsequent recession. Uh, so anyway, so I was teaching this. I was going back further and further in history. And I was doing what I would call a clip job, what we call in journalism a clip job. So every week I would have for that particular thing, I'd have a collection of clips and it was about, you know, this big. There's a million great books written on every single major crises. The problem is you could stack them uh, on top of each other and they'd go from my, uh, the, my, my ceiling, from the floor to the ceiling <laughs> several times. And it's just a lot to read. I mean, I love them. I love reading them all, but uh, it's a lot. So what I wanted to do is take the lectures that I had at Johns Hopkins using the major financial crises, starting actually at the beginning of American history, although I go through that a little bit quickly in the run-up to 1929, but I do do that. And then and then the big ones from 1929 on, um, and there's kind of a lull from the 30s to the 50s, and then we get to the big ones, long-term capital, we get to the savings loan crisis of the 80s, long-term capital, we get Enron, we get, and they all have a specific lesson. Mm -hmm. So, and, and all crises are different from one another, but they all have some similarities and they are all, there's sev several concepts in finance that are useful to know and apply in each case. But anyway, as so I was teaching this and I was using these clips for each of these. And I said, you know, this is ridiculous. I I'm using clips because I can't assign all these books. It's too much to read. They're excellent books, but it's too much. I'm going to write a book based, instead of having clips, I'm going to write the book that I wish someone had given to me when I started as a banking reporter at the Washington Post, which would explain how we got here, how our regulatory system, which is so crazy, uh, sometimes works well and often doesn't, uh, how we got this system, why our Fed is so peculiar looking, doesn't look like anyone else's in any other country. How did we get here? Uh, I wish this is the book that I wish someone had given me as a reporter. Mm -hmm. uh, so I put into this book, and it's much shorter, and I hope written in really plain English, it's a book that goes through the major financial crises from the beginning of the country, the argument with Jefferson and Hamilton over creation of a bank. Really, that argument was an argument over incorporation, uh, which banks are incorporated. Um, and we'll, I'll talk about that in a second. But anyway, I went through So I go th through that, the creation of the Fed, then the creation of all the other regulators. Then I go through all the major crises since then. And from each one, extract the key financial concepts like of moral hazard and easy credit and central banking and lender of last resort and slippery slope. All these key concepts I extract from specific crises. And uh, I put it into one book so that I can use it as a textbook and not have to ask the library to assemble this, this collection of clips every time. So that's, and the broken bargain in it, the bargain refers to two things when it comes to finance. One is incorporation and that it, when you're incorporated and only a government can give you incorporation. So all these incorporated companies that say, hey, government, shut up, leave me alone. Give me my incorporation and then shut up and go away. Free market, free market. Well, guess what? If they really want to be free market, turn in their incorporated status because the government gives them an incorporation and only a government can give it. And what an incorporation does is it in it, it, it says to a company, we're going to treat you as a as a corporate as a corporate body. This is as a body, a hu a, a a a body like a human, but not human. You're a, that's where the word corp, like corpus, incorporation comes from. They're mm -hmm. a body that is she whose investors are shielded from unlimited liability. That's key. Without that limited liability, publicly traded companies couldn't raise money because investors would think, well, wow, if they go belly up, the um, people that are owed money could come and sue me and take everything from my house to my cufflinks, right? They could take everything. When you're shielded from liability as an incorporated entity, you uh, can raise more money because your investors can come in and the most they can lose is their investment. They Their personal property is protected. That's a bargain. In exchange for that, and people forget this often, exchange for getting that incorporated status, 
the government gives that status on behalf of you and me, on behalf of U.S. taxpayers. It says here, companies, we're going to shield you. But in exchange for that, that's a privilege to have that status. We're going to come in and make sure you're not gambling in a way that will hurt society. That's the first bargain. And Hamilton understood it and Jefferson understood it. They understood those things. They just disagreed on whether we needed it or not. But incorporation, do, is it related to banks only or just in general? No, no, it's companies? every publicly traded corporation okay. mm -hmm. has an incorporation. And what Hamilton and Jefferson were fighting about, and you read the book to find out, uh, was whether a state could give that or only the federal. federal. Yep. But now both can. Uh, so but the point is only a state, only a government can give uh, can bequeath the status of being incorporated. And they give it on because the government only exists because of us. It's not there because it's a king or a queen. It's there on behalf of citizens. It gives that status. And therefore, whoever gets that status has entered into a bargain that they're going to agree to allow the government to come in to make sure that they're not screwing around with things and abusing that privilege. Mm -hmm. so, so that's why at the beginning of the country, in corporations, people were very, they understood the need for them, that, that, that they had utility in helping to raise money and, and get the machinery of the economy going. But they were rightly very healthily skeptical of incorporated entities and said, you know what, we're only going to give incorporations for 20 years at a time and for a limited purpose. You can only uh, make a car or an, a railroad thing. And if you want to do anything else, you got to come and get permission. And to make a long story short, over time, the 20 year limit was extended to being in perpetuity. So they, they, yeah. they have the, they have the incorporation and they can do whatever they want as long as their charter allows for it. They don't have to go and get permission. But the bottom line is that essential bargain is still there. The state has given them a status that is a privilege in exchange for which the state reserves the right to come in on behalf of taxpayers and citizens to make sure that the company isn't doing bad things like polluting the water or, or throwing garbage out that's radioactive and not cleaning it up or polluting the air or creating undue risk or wandering money to, to, so that we're attracting criminals. So that's the first bargain. So banks, like all other corporations, have a special incorporation incorporation status, and and that's why you often it does a for it, again it's it's like not calling a derivative uh, insurance you call it a swap just so you mm -hmm. don't have certain yeah. literally uh, a lot of banks have the charter they have is called an association but it's just a charter and there's ridiculous political reasons why it changed but so banks have incorporation so they right there as Hamilton argued in front of George Washington, we, when we incorporate banks, we have the right to go in and make sure they're not uh, doing the bad things that Jefferson's so worried about. So we, we're going to go in and do that. That's the first bargain. Secondly, since the 1930s with deposit insurance, which banks didn't want, but now they love, they love, love, love deposit insurance because it is U.S. taxpayers saying, don't worry, your deposits are protected. And it really does diminish and reduce runs significantly. Yep. Because people know, in exchange for that government taxpayer bailout, a, a potential bailout that if you go under, we'll come in and 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 because customers know that they're going to do business with you. In exchange for that, we get to come in and make sure you're not gambling and doing silly things. Because if you do, you taxpayers are going to have to come in. You're going to lose money, and to pay back depositors, taxpayers are going to ha have to come in. So. The broken bargain is that there's two ways that financial institutions in particular have a bargain with the American people. One, because they're incorporated, and two, because they have deposit insurance. And I don't care if you're a mega corporation, uh, financial corporation, say like Goldman Sachs, which has uh, non-depository insured institutions and everything else. The system rests, the stability of the financial system rests on institutions that have deposit insurance, because without it, it would become so destabilizing that um, it would be wacky. And over time, that idea of the government providing deposit insurance, because these mega corporations that have lots of non-bank entities, they're financial, they have commercial banks and real estate entities and all these other things, 
because within that structure there is a f a, a depository insur there's a there's insurance deposit there's an there's an institution within these mega financial institutions they all have a unit that has deposit insurance because to to preserve the health of that system that deposit system the government in effect has pulled the safety net over the head of the entire corporation and you saw that you saw that with the uh, with um, Silicon Valley Bank, in deposits above the two hundred and fifty limit insured, yep. uh, and going in and stabilizing the whole thing. So what people forget in exchange for that privilege of having an incorporation that allows you to raise money because it limits liabilities of your investor, and in exchange for that deposit insurance, which is kind of the ballast of the whole system, the government not only has the right, but the obligation on behalf of the public to go in and make sure you're not doing cockamamie things like they do over and over again. And that's it. That's the that's what the bargain is. And it's been broken because people like uh, at the Fed, regulators under Trump and everything else said, oh, the sun's shining. We'll never need umbrellas again. Let's throw out the umbrellas. Well, that doesn't really make a lot of sense, does it? Because guess what? When trouble comes, who's going to have to pay to go buy new umbrellas? Taxpayers. And we're talking about troubles on a big scale. On a small scale, technically, the uh, each financial institution should pay the insurance premium to cover that uh, FDIC, right? Yeah, except that those those are a fiction, you know. And they knew it. If you read the congressional transcripts from the '30s, which I got to do when I wrote my book, I learned so much. Um, mm. They knew that it was a fiction. Those premiums don't nearly cover. Got it. Because in deposit insurance in day to day, it does preserve calm, but you don't really need it. When you really need deposit insurance is in times of trouble. And then the amount of money required would exhaust the funds in the deposit. Like in the yeah. 2007, 2012, there wasn't enough money in the deposit insurance fund to fix all those banks. So you had to have these, you had, you had to have other money. So it's a fiction. And also what people don't realize is deposit insurance, while it preserves your money individually up to a certain amount and makes you psychologically feel better. The point of deposit insurance is not to make you feel better, but to make each of us feel yeah. better so that collectively we don't have a run in the bank. Yep. Deposit insurance is there to stabilize the system, not to make you feel better, but to stabilize the system, it has to make you feel better. Are you pro Fed or against Fed? Uh, the Fed is an inevitability. We can't do without a central bank. And in Thank fact, you. It, if you read the beginning of my book and you understand uh, how we got our current, you, you, people don't realize we did not have a national currency in the United States until after the Civil War. That yeah. I that was, I mean, if you, if traveling from state to state was like traveling before the euro in Europe where you had to convert money every state. It was crazy. Um, so the the history of our getting a central bank and currency is a crazy, crazy history fraught with fights and all kinds of things. And 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 it really reflects Americans' deep-seated, I don't care what your politics are, deep-seated mistrust of central government, which is healthy. But it also, uh, anyone who thinks we can do without a Fed um, or without a currency that is backed by the government is ridiculous. That's why I think crypto is the, is one of the longest running scams that there is um it's it, it is just a scam it is it is uh and and people who made money on it well good for you you just got to sit down when the music stopped before some other sucker was left standing um cryptos is is garbage and it's gar and if, and if you understand if you read my book and really understand how we got from the creation of the country financially uh the creation of the company a country and moved through to the regulatory structure we have, including the establishment of the Fed, you will understand why crypto is, is just silly. It's just silly. I mean, you know what crypto is like? It's like chips in a casino. When you go into a casino and you exchange your money for uh, chips, those chips have value in the context of the casino. But if someone yells fire, fire, you're not going to want to take your chips and go outside and try to get a taxi. No one's going to accept it as money. You want to go back and exchange it. And that's what crypto is. When there's a fire, no one wants chips. They want money. They want dollars. And the reason crypto is denominated in dollars and the reason the crooks who set up the crypto system, uh, th th you'll see that they may get their money in crypto, but they immediately exchange it for dollars. Immediately. They know. Yeah, I agree with you on that front that everyone in crypto wants deregulation until it went down. 
when suddenly they wanted to be bailed out. I'm like, okay, that doesn't really work like that. That's the whole point of, well, and the of whole your point argument, of it. And just so fall if, apart. Yeah, and if you have a regulated <laughs> currency, we, we already have one. It's called the US dollar. Yep. <laughs> so, yep. And so now the, it, the, the one, and, 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 and so they did what magicians do. They tried to make you not look at what was going on. The reason people have trouble, if you try to really pin someone down, what is a Bitcoin? What is it? And they're sort of like humana humana, and they tell you what it can. They they give you all kinds of nonsense. They can't explain it because it's unexplainable. It's silly. Uh, when someone can't explain something simply in finance, be very skeptical. Uh, they either don't understand it or they don't want you to. And probably in crypto, it's a lot of both. But there, the the um, blockchain is a real technology. The problem is blockchain was not the a holy grail or the perfect system that everyone thought. It's it's cumbersome on large scale. It, it it's uh, energy eating on a large scale, and it's 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 not easy to use on a large scale. So it's a real thing, but it it's not bad. Good, but everyone kept saying, "Oh, but we have this system that's so great," and 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 it was like diverting your attention to what the magician was doing over here is is selling you something that was stupid. Um, so so uh, crypto is just a a silliness. I mean, it is true that money is whatever we agree it is. And it is also true, sometimes crypto people will say, well, the US dollar is backed by nothing. It's true, we have a fiat system, meaning we're, it's not backed by anything, it's not backed by gold. But guess what it's backed by? It's backed by our democracy and our military and our court system and us, us taxpayers. That's why there's a flight to safety. Anytime there's a financial crisis, people flock to US securities. They flock all the tyrants of the world in Russia, in China, all have property in the United States. They all want to live here because they know if they have a dispute, they can get a fair hearing in the courts. We're not perfect, but we are way more perfect than anywhere else. So the, the, that's you're not going to get that with crypto. I mean, it's just it's it's junk. It's it, it you know you and I can agree we're going to trade grasshoppers as a way to trade, but if there's a recession, I don't think our grasshoppers are going to be worth very much. Yeah. Well. That that's uh, probably the per perfect conclusion for this interview.